Welcome. What comes to mind when we hear the word terrorism? Our guest today, David Rubin, is going to lift the veil which has hidden the truth about the impact of terrorism in Israel on our most vulnerable people, that is children. It's the unseen tears of the children who've been affected by the evils of terrorism. David, welcome. Thank you. Glad Good to you're be here. with you. Good. Well, um, you know, a very traumatic event, a very traumatic personal event actually catapulted you into this um, mission of, of on behalf of, of the children of Israel. You want to tell us briefly about that and then we'll go to a video clip. Well, this occurred 10 years ago mm -hmm. uh, when, when I was coming back from Jerusalem with my three-year-old son uh, after a day outing. Uh, we drove back in my car and, and halfway home the, bullet, the car was hit by a massive hail of bullets from terrorists on the side of the road. I was shot in the leg, my son was shot in the head, and uh, well, I'm, I'm thankful the bullet that, that went into his head missed his brain stem by one millimeter, mm -hmm. uh, but it did a lot of damage first. Mm -hmm. And it was a very tra traumatic experience, three, uh, well, we, we spent three and a half weeks in the hospital and uh, we had several operations. My son had to go through many months of psychological post-trauma therapy, uh, but we survived. Um, I'm, I'm thankful, th re very thankful to God that, that we survived that attack. Now let's go to the clip which describes you when, and shows you going back to the actual scene of where that happened. I was coming back from Jerusalem with my three-year-old son buckled behind me in the baby seat. We were coming up to this junction up here, which we call the T-junction. We pulled up to this point, and suddenly there was a massive hail of bullets on the car. The car was dead. The bullets were flying, and I felt a bullet go into my left leg. The blood started coming out like an open fire hydrant. A bullet also hit three-year-old Ruby in the head. I have to tell you, I've been a believer in the God of Israel for over 25 years. But up until that point, I was always a little bit skeptical about personal miracle stories. But I'm certainly not a skeptic any, any longer because we were just lifted up on God's wings to get us to that ambulance. And after that day, I knew that I wasn't going to be the same. And I just wanted to give thanks to the Almighty for saving my son's life. And I wanted to help all of the children who suffered from terrorism in the biblical heartland of Israel. So can you tell us, David, after that occurred, um, how, how, were, how did your wife feel? How did your relatives feel? How did you feel about uh, the, the whole issue of terrorism it, when she became a personal victim? Well, we had already had a lot of experience with terrorism. Mm -hmm. Uh, you just take a walk through my neighborhood, uh, go, go across the street from my house and walk to the corner. The first house on the corner lost their 17-year-old son who was in his high school library with other children when, when the terrorists, terrorists came in, started spraying machine gun fire everywhere, leaving all of these children in a pool of blood. So it was equivalent to something like the Columbine massacre that occurred uh, about, I don't know, 20 years ago in Colorado, but, but it, this happens on a regular basis. The thing is, the <laughs> thing is that, that it wasn't just one isolated right. event. Let's continue our imaginary walk. You go to the very next house on that street, you come to a family who lost their 17-year-old son when he was standing at a bus stop waiting to go take his high school exams. The very next house after that, 19-year-old girl who was standing at a different bus stop. She was killed also by terrorists. Three houses further down that street, a family lost their 17-year-old son who was playing basketball at his high school when terrorists came and started shooting everybody. He was killed along with others. Just go around the corner from there and you have a family who lost their five-month-old baby. He was killed when a, 
when a rock was thrown at his head by, by young terrorists, five months old. Wow. This is all in one street. And there have been so many other terror victims, thousands, but, but I'm, I'm telling you those so you understand the intensity of the terrorism in the biblical heartland where I live. And when you understand that, you can understand also a little bit the minds of the terrorists who would commit su such acts. Well, can you tell us a little bit about what would motivate people to, you know, so personally and slaughter and annihilate innocent children like that? But what's the psychology behind that? Well, it's, uh, this is something that I've, I've written about in my book, The Islamic Tsunami, where I, I get into the minds of the, the terrorists. What does it come from? You know, when, when, when we were shot and wounded, I wasn't thinking about why the, the terrorists would do this or, or w what is it that, that causes them to commit such horrific acts. Mm -hmm. And certainly my three-year-old son who was shot in the head wasn't thinking that. Mm -hmm. But several years later when I started to really research it and explore it, I realized that this is religiously sanctioned killing. Hmm. There is a central concept, a central concept in Islam that, that sanctions the killing. It's called jihad, which means holy war against all non-Muslims. Now, when you ask a Muslim, he, he, many, many Muslims will lie to you and they'll tell you, uh, well, it's not, it's not religiously sanctioned killing. It, it means, jihad means internal spiritual struggle. Yeah, or the, it's, it's like equivalent to our spiritual warfare kind of concept. Yes, uh, except Jews and Christians mm -hmm. have always believed in different central concepts. Right. You know, in, in Judaism, there is a, uh, the, there's a saying that says what, uh, there, there was someone who came to, uh, the, to Rabbi Hillel, who was one of the, the great biblical sages, and he went to him and, 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 and he said, Rabbi, teach me about Judaism. And the rabbi, the, the rabbi, and he said, teach me about Judaism in a very quick way. What is Judaism about? You know, give, me, give it to me in one sentence, basically. A 30-second soundbite, huh? And what did the rabbi say? He said it means, what is hateful to you, do not do unto others. That is the whole story of Judaism. Now go and learn, now go learn the rest. Hmm. And, and obviously Christianity has developed that love your neighbor concept right. From, right. from this basic precept which is written in, in the five books of Moses. So, uh, Islam is very different. It, they're not fundamentally the same religions as a lot of people think. No, which is it does. a different flavor. It is not an outgrowth of Judaism or Christianity. It is a rejection of Judaism or Christianity. Uh, Judaism obviously comes from the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. it, ha it, it had its birth in the land of Israel in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their teachings, mm -hmm. and Moses on Mount Sinai, and Joshua, who led the children of Israel into the land of Israel. However, Islam, and, oh, and of course, excuse me, Jesus, obviously, also has his roots in the land of Israel. He was a Jew who lived in the land of Israel, and basically he was an Orthodox yeah, Jew, much like right, myself, right. Uh, who lived in the land of Israel, had his teachings, and his teachings were mainly Torah. His teachings mainly come from, came from the, five the, from the book, yeah, right. from the Holy Book, from, right. from the five books of Moses and the writings of the prophets and so on. Right. Uh, he quoted them a lot. <laughs> he certainly did, and, I, and obviously... There were, there were differences in, in his philosophy, some of his philosophies and the mainstream of Judaism. But it comes from the same root in the land of Israel. Right. Yeah. Islam was created by Muhammad, who was, uh, who was the founder of Islam. The Muslims call him Muhammad the Prophet. Uh, 
But the Jews and Christians who lived on the Arabian Peninsula where he lived rejected his false claims of prophecy. As a result of that rejection, he said that he was going to create a new religion, he was going to call it Islam. He, he created a new holy book, he called it the Quran. And, and he, in, he created a new central concept, which was contrary to loving your neighbor. It was called Jihad, holy war against all the non-believers. And the modern day, modern day follow-up to Islam is terrorism, is Islamic terrorism. It's not an accident that every terrorist organization in the United States is, call, is Islamic. Mm -hmm. That's and true. And as I wrote in my book, it's not an accident that there, there is no terrorist organization today called Baptist Jihad. Right. Because Christianity has evolved. Yes, there has been a lot of persecution of the Jewish people by Christians through the centuries, but in our times, Christianity has evolved to a religion that believes in love and, and certainly not terrorism. Right. Now, um, I have a clip here that, that uh, shows uh, basically a, a little bit of insight into a, a woman who was a terrorist and, and um, was responsible, very much responsible for a horrendous act that occurred. So let's go to that clip briefly. Suicide terror bombings, roadside shootings, and other terror attacks produced a gruesome harvest of death, pain, and injury all over Israel. Alham Tamimi is a Hamas Palestinian security prisoner serving 16 life terms in an Israeli jail for the Sabaro Pizzeria terrorist bombing in 2001 that killed 15 Israelis and wounded 130. Alham drove the suicide bomber Shuahil al Masri to the restaurant in central Jerusalem, admonishing him forward in his murderous goal. She only left the area when she heard the bomber detonating his deadly charge. When asked if she had considered the people inside the restaurant when she heard the blast, she said no. When asked if she was aware of how many children were among the 15 dead, she guessed three. When told the actual number was eight young fatalities, she smiled, pleasantly surprised, seemingly glad that the figure was eight, more than she thought. This is the twisted face of Islamic fundamentalist terrorism that victimizes Israeli children. Now, that, that clip is really very disturbing. Is that the typical mindset of a jihadist of a terrorist um, that basically takes pleasure in in doing this very heinous act. Is well, that unfortunately it is. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately it is, and and it's very sad and it's very frightening. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Isn't it kind of uh, inflammatory though to to show something like this? I mean, doesn't it incite? Uh, hatred against all the Arab people and against Muslims, or are we really talking about um, terrorists per se? I mean, where's the dividing line? And, uh, it's a very fine dividing yeah. line. It's a very fine dividing line. Uh, obviously, uh, this was a, a clip about, uh, about a terrorist in the mind of a terrorist. However, the problem is that if you look at the Palestinian Authority, Okay, that, that, that Which has is the governing body the, 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 yeah. right the governing body mm -hmm. uh, of the autonomous areas, which are primarily Arab Muslim, and they had free elections, you have to remember. Back in 2000, 2006, they had free elections. And it, in fact, even Jimmy Carter, who, who was certainly no friend of Israel. Okay. Uh, went there to supervise the elections and he, he confirmed that they were free and fair elections. Mm. And obviously, uh, being anti-Israel, Jimmy Carter had some interest in, in showing that the Palestinians were having free and fair elections. However, mm -hmm. the reality was that, uh, that he didn't, didn't care to point out mm -hmm. 
-hmm. is that who, who did they elect? Mm -hmm. First place, the Hamas terrorist organization. Second place, the Fatah terrorist organization. Third place, the Islamic Jihad terrorist organization. Yeah. And they were elected by the average man in the street, mm -hmm. the average Arab Muslim in the land of Israel. So we're talking about a people that is sworn to our destruction, that, that seeks to destroy Western civilization. And shortly after my book, The Islamic Tsunami, came out, which, by the way, is available on Amazon.com. Uh, shortly after it came out, uh, there, there were some interesting things that happened in the Islamic world. They had what, what, what was called the pro-democracy movement in Egypt and Libya and other places. They called it the Arab Spring. Yeah, yeah I was going to ask you, do you think that's the Arab Spring? I think it's the Islamic tsunami. Mm -hmm what it turned into because, well, let's just backtrack a minute, mm -hmm. the Islamic Revolution in Iran. I don't know if you remember that. Yes, but, I do. No, actually, oh, I know okay. some people who were involved in that. Okay, well, originally, it was also considered to be a pro-democracy movement. Right, and it didn't turn out to be. Okay, the, the oh, Muslim... The Shah, yeah. Yep, the right. Islamic ideologues were hiding behind the scenes, Eventually, it became clear that what it was, was an Islamic revolution, okay, what I call an Islamic tsunami. Right, right. And in Egypt as well, they just had their free and fair elections in Egypt. Eighty percent of the, of the parliament in Egypt is now Muslim Brotherhood and Salafis. Now, Muslim Brotherhood doesn't mean... Uh, it's, a, it's not like what Christians would do in a fellowship hall. It is the, this is a violent organization that is about 100 years old, and their basic doctrine calls for, a, and I quote, a globalist, jihadist process to destroy and eliminate the Western civilization from within. That means the United States of America, that means Europe, that is what their goal is. Well, but you know, some people would think that these people, it's just because they've been outcast and on the outside that they've been so troubled and upset and violent. But now that they're getting into positions of power and authority, uh, that they're going to settle down and become more reasonable and democratic. Oh yes, well we've certainly mm. seen that. As soon mm. as the Palestinian Authority, headed by Yasser Arafat, uh, came to power, we had the massive wave of terrorism in Israel. And we have had 20 years of the most intense terrorism and war on Israel since that Palestinian Authority was created. So the truth is just the opposite. Mm -hmm. The truth is that it comes from an ideology, it comes from, from fundamental values that are contrary to the values that people in the United States, Israel, and other places adhere to. Now, you, you have responded to this um, jihad mentality in a very personal way by developing an organization that, that helps children who are recovering from traumatic events. Is that right? Yes. Uh, shortly after, my, when, after the terrorist attack, three weeks later, three and a half weeks later, when my son came back from the hospital, he was screaming every single night, just mm -hmm. walking through the house screaming. Mm -hmm. Now, when he was shot, his eyes were wide open, his mouth was wide open. He looked like he was trying to scream or cry, but no sounds could come out. Oh. So now when he was back from the hospital and he was screaming every night, almost like that scream that he couldn't make after he was wounded, my wife and I realized that there is deep psychological trauma, mm. not just in him, 
but we soon found out that there is deep psychological trauma in thousands of children in Samaria, in the biblical heartland where we live. And I also realized that God had put in my hands a mission. Hmm. Uh, God had said basically, here is an amazing story to tell, and you can use this for good. And so and I, let's, let's go to a clip which talks about uh, what your organization does and how it's, it's working with children. Okay? okay, great. The Shiloh Israel Children's Fund has become a source of hope and joy for the residents of Shiloh and other Jewish communities in the region. Through its support of child therapy programs, educational enrichment projects, and recreational centers for youth, the Shiloh Israel Children's Fund is making a difference for thousands of youngsters. Unfortunately, there is a disproportionate amount of children in our area who suffer from psychological trauma. Very often this trauma is a result of a terror attack in which a friend or a family member has been killed or wounded. These children are holding in a lot of pain. And for that reason, we decided that the first priority of the fund had to be to focus on emotional therapy for these children, to help them cope and to help them get back to a more normal life. Music therapy can help children uh, get through the trauma, talk about the trauma, and uh, get through it more easier. The children in Sheila are completely aware of what is going on around us. Whether we try to hide it, whether we don't, they hear what's going on, and we don't want to hide it, because that's not healthy. We feel that it's very important to have programs, therapy programs, educational programs, recreational programs, to help these children deal with these issues. But we would like for them to have a normal upbringing not to take away from their youth, not to take away from their, their fun as children because we know that's really a basis for a healthy lifestyle um, for their entire life. The Shiloh Israel Children's Fund supports the Therapy with Horses program at Givat Harel west of Shiloh. Children come here from all over Samaria, from the north, from the south, from the east, from the west, and they come here to be treated for emotional trauma stemming from terror attacks, from other kinds of emotional trauma that children have experienced. Children with physical ailments, CP, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome children, and they ride the horses, and there's something that happens, something almost magical that happens. It's a center to help children victims of terror and those suffering from all types of trauma. The Shiloh Israel Children's Fund established this petting zoo at the school in Shiloh. The first thing is the connection between the therapist and the child, and the animals themselves help a lot in that respect. They contribute very much as the means of communication between the therapist and the child. Besides that, everything that happens to the animals themselves, giving birth to young, caring for little ones, sickness and of course death, cause the children to identify with many of the same experiences they've undergone. What happens to the animals speaks to them in their own experiences and serves as a relief for them in these experiences. David, what kind of opposition do you get to this wonderful work that you're doing? I mean, I can't imagine you'd get any, but is there some? Well, the, the only opposition that, that we get is from people who, who's, who say, well, you're in the West Bank and they're rebuilding you know, those areas and, and helping Jews to, to live there in, in, a, in a better way, in a healthier way, uh, is, is a problem because you're not supposed to be there. And, that, and frankly, that is, that is a, it is a problem. For us, there, there are, there are uh, a lot of people out there who specifically will not give us support because we're in the West Bank. However, there are a lot of people who will give us support specifically for that reason, because they, because they know that what we're doing is important. We're rebuilding the biblical heartland through the children. What, what, what could be more wonderful than that? Right. And then there are a lot of people who, who may not agree 100% politically with what I have to say, but they know that it's about children. And that's, that's the real message here, that, that we're about helping children. And, and people in Samaria have a lot of children. 
the Jewish families there. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we're, we're the only place in the world that is winning that demographic struggle mm -hmm. uh, with the Islamic world. And, and we're people having children, they're, they're raising big families, they're teaching them well, they're becoming ideal citizens. And any children who have been through our programs, through our therapeutic programs, and been healed, they, they become that much stronger. So, so that, that's ensuring a positive functional foundation. A uh, positive functional right. foundation right. and a positive future. Right. Now, how can our viewers uh, support this endeavor? How, how can we be praying? How can we support you? Sure. Well, there, there are very practical ways. Uh, people can go right to our website, mm -hmm. which is Shiloh, S-H-I-L-O-H, mm -hmm. Shiloh Israel, Children.org, Shiloh, Israel, Children.org. Uh, there are videos, there are, there are stories about the children, uh, practical information about how to give a donation. And people can give a donation online on the website. Uh, they, can, they can even give a monthly donation on the website if they wish. Uh, it's very easy, just click the button. And, uh, and for those who aren't internet savvy, I know there are a few people out there. Uh, my my 86-year-old mother has a very hard time on the computer. Uh, there, there may be young people who have a hard time on the computer. And all they have to do is send in a donation to Shiloh Israel Children's Fund, P.O. Box 212, Suffer, New York, 10901. And how can we be praying for, for what you're doing? Well, I always tell people to pray for the biblical heartland of Israel. Pray that your leaders, that your politicians who, who, are, who are supposed to be doing what you voted them in for, will stand with Israel and stand with the biblical heartland of Israel and stand with the children of Israel in these difficult times. Thank you so much, David, for being with us. Thank you. Uh, I really haven't ever considered the issue from the children's perspective before. What about you? Please join the dialogue and friend us uh, on Facebook, KSCE Channel 38. Thank you for watching.